Seeing none, I will move on to our land acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather today is the land traditionally used by the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral people. We also acknowledge the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge and philosophies of the indigenous people with whom we share this land today. As has been our practice, a moment of refl reflection as we begin the public portion of our meetings. At the beginning of this council meeting, we pause to think about the needs of our community. May we show wisdom, compassion in all our decisions. I've already asked for the uh, disclosure of pecuni pecuniary interests. Could I ask for an approval of the minutes, please? Uh, Mayor Jorsky, second by uh, Councillor Freeman. All in favor? Carried. Terrific. And that brings us, with all those minutes, that brings us down to a late starter. And I apologize that I didn't mention that before. And our late starter is, uh, the report is on your table. It's uh, CORP 2020-003. Um, it's the ratification of our QP agreement. And Kathy Wethaus is available should we have any questions. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, can I, I'll ask for someone to make the motion. Councillor Henry, second uh, Councillor Veith, all in favor? And that is all of us. That's carried. Thank you. Uh, maybe a, a moment to say thank you to staff in working through the agreement and, and coming to conclusion before the end of the agreement, which is great. Congratulations. And that moves us now on to staff presentations. The Award of Excellence, the Center for Advancement of uh, Trenchless Technology. And I believe both Carolyn or Dan is to the, uh, to the podium. Oh, you got that. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, let me just raise this up a little bit so you can hear me for sure. Uh, so Caroline and I are pleased to present council with an award that the city recently received from the Center for Advancement of Trenchless Technology, or CAT, at the University of Waterloo. Um, at its annual general meeting last fall, CAT presented the city with an award of excellence as an outstanding organization. And we were recognized, and I quote, as a committed supporter of CAT and the trenchless technology industry for our willingness to volunteer extensive history of research, collaboration, and devotion to helping municipalities solve their buried infrastructure problems. Um, so before we present council with the award, I'd like to go through just a short presentation to highlight um, the city's history of involvement with trenches technology and with CAT, which goes back more than 25 years, definitely before many of our times, but nonetheless, 25 years. And um, so this presentation is, is just a trimmed down version, essentially, of what we presented at the AGM uh, in the fall. There it goes. So the agenda is pretty straightforward. I'll just describe first how we got involved in trenchless technology, um, highlight a few key projects that we've undertaken over the years, and uh, touch on how we've supported some research on trenchless technology and how staff have been involved with CAT, and then lastly, kind of how we see things going forward. So I understand you might have heard a little bit about this this morning, so I apologize if it's a bit repetitive, but I'll go through it pretty quickly. Um, our experience with trenchless technology began, as I said, about 25 years ago. And um, it was actually related to black pipe. And um, so during World War II, governments had mandated limited domestic use of steel to aid the war effort. Um, and that, plus the lower manufacturing cost of black pipe as compared to, say, steel, clay, or concrete pipes, um, led to the rapid adoption of black pipe for sanitary laterals, drains, and conduits. And it remained a popular choice for sewer laterals following the end of the war until about the 60s, um, when all the plastics started to be introduced. And during the 50s and 60s, which was a period of rapid growth for the city, we had approximately 4,000 that were installed uh, in the city. However, many homeowners began experiencing premature failures and sewer backups due to the collapse of the pipes. And then by the 90s, enough of these had occurred that uh, it was recognized as a significant issue. Initially, um, we were replacing the laterals with new pipes, just using open cut excavation from the house to the street. But of course, this took a few days to complete. It was pretty disruptive to homeowners and city residents in general, and it cost a fair amount, uh, even in 90s dollars, about 6,500 per lateral. So not surprisingly, the city was looking for a better way to do this. And um, in 94, it partnered with the University of Waterloo to explore lower cost, less disruptive methods. And out of that partnership came a solution. 
um, which we now know today as pipe bursting, and it could be completed basically within a day. It wasn't nearly as disruptive to the homeowners and residents, and it cost about a third less than the open cut method did. So that success, not only with the partnership, but just with the technology in general, um, led to some, some groundswell and some support for the development of a research center to help municipalities solve buried infrastructure problems. And in 94, CAT was founded at the University of Waterloo through a partnership between the university, the city, the National Research Council of Canada, and 25 founding municipalities, industrial equipment and material suppliers, contractors, consultants, gas company members, etc. And over the past 25 years, the CAT membership has continued to reflect that mix of industry representation, and they continue to work with those groups to develop new trenchless technologies to solve problems and improve existing methods. So continuing what began in 94, the City of Waterloo and CAT have successfully partnered on uh, many occasions since then. And uh, for example, there are a few notable pilot and construction projects um, that we've worked on together, and I'm going to highlight just three of them briefly for you in the following slides. So the first project I'll highlight took place in the early 2000s. Um, the city was receiving a lot of complaints about discolored water, generally from areas with old iron water mains or cast iron water mains. Most of those pipes were in good condition structurally um, with minimal loss of hydraulic capacity, so cement mortar lining was seen as a potentially viable solution. It wasn't so much of an impermeable physical barrier, it was more of a chemical treatment and then it changed the chemistry of the pipe wall interface to prevent corrosion in the pipe. And over a two year period, about 52 kilometers of iron water main was cement mortar lined as a pilot project in uptown Waterloo. And then to evaluate its success, uh, water quality samples and resident surveys were obtained before, during and after the lining uh, and we did see an overall improvement in water quality as well as a reduction in discolored water calls. In addition to the lining pilot, we also um, developed a unidirectional flushing program, which was a less costly and non-invasive operational tool to mitigate discolored water in certain areas. And um, that in fact continues today as part of our maintenance program. The next project I'll highlight was in 2012. This was the twinning of the Laurel Sanitary Trunk Sewer through the uptown core. Um, you can kind of see in the map there, generally along DuPont Street in front of the library. Uh, this project was identified in our sanitary master plan as a priority undertaking um, and it was needed to provide additional capacity to accommodate growth um, pretty much for the entire west side and the core of the city. So a significant portion of that sewer, about 430 meters or almost half of the total length, uh, was installed using trenchless technology. In fact, it was the first use of microtunneling, or at least the use of a tunnel boring machine in Waterloo. And it was used because the ground conditions were very challenging and the sewer was deep and below the groundwater table. A um, significant amount of dewatering would have been required using traditional construction methods. We also would have exposed and had to deal with subsurface contamination from old landfill and industrial uses. And of course, it's running through the uptown, which is a busy urban environment, um, difficult to cause a lot of disruption to open cut that at that scale. So in the picture, you can see the successful breakthrough of the boring machine um, completing its underground journey into the termination shaft right on target, which was essentially that pink um, membrane area there. And the final project that I'll highlight was the 2014 piloting of what's called the Tomahawk system on city water mains on Albert Street and Hazel Street. The Tomahawk system is a methodology that uses abrasives such as crushed, crushed granite rock um, in a high volume, low pressure air stream to clean and dry a pipe in preparation for lining. And in 2014, the technology was just being developed and the city was very interested in partnering on this um, because the technology did have some potential to reduce out of service times and to reduce or eliminate the need for temporary water mains on certain projects. So again, a couple more pictures of that um, may not be that easy to see, but uh, the picture on the left, for example, uh, is just showing the upstream end of the operation where the um, abrasive rocks are being sort of drawn into the airstream and then into the pipe. And then the far right picture shows the downstream end where they're collected back into a vacuum truck. So there's, there's no material lost in that process. Beyond just project involvements, the city has also partnered with CAD in supporting research in trenchless technology. We've shared data and provided funds used to support at least four PhD students, two postdocs, two master students, and numerous underground research assistants. And we've also provided in-kind support for various research projects, including for example, the Asset Management Collaboration, the Cat Water Research Foundation Project on Drinking Water Pipeline Defect Condition Rating, that's a mouthful, and the National Research Council's Guidelines on a Comprehensive Analysis of Benefits, Costs and Uncertainties of Storm Drainage Infrastructure and a Changing Climate. So I briefly talked about the genesis of our involvement in trenches technology and, some, and giving you some project highlights and the research we've supported. However, 
definitely would be remiss if I didn't talk about people because the people are our strength. And I think it's important to recognize that there's been many current and former city staff members that have been involved um, in our partnership with CAT over the past 25 near years. And you can see some of the names there. Um, but for example, we've participated on the board of directors. Um, everyone from Tom Stocky is a founding member to Bill Garibaldi, Jonathan Pierce have all functioned in the chair's role. Um, Jonathan's also been involved in the seminar committee as well as Caroline, who's here, of course. And then even some former staff like Denise McGoldrick, Prasad Samarkoon, Phil Cookfall, and, and of course, Brad's still here, but um, you know, some staff have been involved in various research initiatives. And then many, of course, many staff at many levels um, are, are involved in participating in training seminars and workshops, et cetera both as attendees and as presenters. <coughs> so what do we see for our involvement with trenchless technology going forward into the future? Um, well, from staff's perspective, I guess more of the same. We've had a pretty good thing going. Um, our partnership with CAD has been fruitful and successful, and I think both parties would say that. Um, so we look forward to continuing that. Um, we do envision staff continuing to play a role uh, in CAD initiatives, i.e. collaborating on research, attending and presenting at events like we have been and working together on construction and pilot projects as opportunities arise. And even from a general perspective, whether it's among staff or in working with other industry partners, um, certainly it's beneficial for the city to continue to support the advancement of knowledge in and application of trenchless technology. So that concludes the presentation. It's pretty brief, but I hope it's been a little bit informative. If council has any questions, we'd be happy to take them. And then maybe following that, I would actually um, like to have Caroline Amio will present the award to council, and as you know, she's a valued member of our engineering services team, but what you may not know is she's also the newly elected vice chair of the CAP Board of Directors this year. So congratulations, Caroline. <laughs> and that's it for me at this point. Thank you. Dan, Dan, thank you very much for that informative presentation. It's kind of interesting to see the progression in the 10 years that we've been part of it and the technology and the innovations that have come forward. I will open it to council. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, let's get going with the presentation. Uh, Carol? Uh, I believe there's a photographer, perhaps. Yep, there we go. Congratulations again, Carolyn, and thank you, Dan. Uh, that moves us along to item 7B, which is the Integrated Planning and Public Works Business Plan Presentation. Uh, Commissioner Rapp, I believe you are doing the presentation. That's correct, Councillor Hanmer. Um, thank you, Chair Hanmer. Uh, members of council, Mayor Jaworski, I was going to say members of the public, uh, but staff as well. Um, I have the envious position and uh, am proud to present the IPPW business plan this afternoon. Um, I'm joined by the experts, the directors. I've got uh, Roy Garbitz um, for utilities, Joel Cotter for planning, uh, Francis Reyes for Engineering Services, I see Adam Fishbach for Building Standards, and of course Christine Kaler with Transportation. And we also have Mr. Ormson as uh, the backup for anything that none of us know. Uh, Ron can help us out as well. Um, with that, uh, I thought I'd move on to the presentations. Um, first talk about Integrated Planning and Public Works. I'm not going to read every word on the slides today, um, so I'm going to add a little, a little bit. Um, save your questions, if you could, till the end. Um, as I don't have to answer them, they'll all be answered by the directors. So please hold them back. Um, IPPW, uh, as a department, we're responsible for the growth and the built form of our city and the maintenance of our linear assets which is typically, it's our underground and our, our stream systems. Um, it's a highly regulated group uh, realm. Virtually everything we do 
is regulated by law. Um, there's the Construction Act, the Migratory Birds Act, the Clean Water Act, the Building Code Act, the Heritage Act, the Planning Act, the Fisheries Act, the Condo Act. It goes on. Um, of course, we also have the Municipal Act, which we all have to abide by, but it is highly regulated. Um, and as such, the work is conducted by or through licensed or registered professionals within IPPW. Um, within the five divisions that I've highlighted and those uh, directors. It works, in my mind, very well. Um, we have no silos. Uh, we all know the importance of the connections to each other and the reliance that the community has on our services. With that, I'll move on to community interest. Um, I've decided to merge the community impact onto one slide all for IPPW as opposed to inserting a slide for each division. Um, IPPW's impact on the community has been and will be massive, to be quite honest. Um, it will happen every single day and tied to the strategic plan. Um, it touches on equity and inclusion, infrastructure renewal, sustainability, growth, to name a few of the pillars. Virtually anybody and everybody getting out of bed in the morning will be impacted. They'll go to the bathroom, they'll get a drink, they'll walk downstairs or upstairs, they go outside, they walk, they drive to a store or your place of employment. It's all linked and there's very little thought put to it. You run up the stairs without thinking about will it collapse. Well, that's because we've, it's been designed, it's been reviewed, and it's been inspected to ensure it doesn't collapse. Uh, same with the water system. It, these are the things that link our community to our department every day. And it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you live, what your income is, what you do for a living, you're all touched by this and will be touched by it um, in Waterloo. But no one, as I said, no one will think about it. Um, why? Um, you take it for granted, and that's fine, because the city of Waterloo has about 200 people thinking about it and working behind the scenes for the community. Moving on to the actual individual divisions, um, it's all alphabetical, not necessarily by our process, which is different. It starts with planning and moves through through to maintenance, which is uh, utilities and transportation. But it's been set up alphabetically. Again, I'm not going to speak to every point, but some of the key initiatives for building standards, we will be receiving the entire building standard uh, fleet will be pure electric vehicles this summer. Um, it, took, oh, it takes about a year to order these things, so we should be getting them in the summer. We plan on doing public engagement and education, going out to the big box stores to talk about the value of getting a permit and the safety. Um, and we're going to be doing a building permit fee review. Um, our fees have not increased, I think, since about 2003. Um, even though our complement of uh, building has in increased, um, our fees have not. We're still, if not the lowest within the region, one of the lowest. What do we measure and how do we know we'll be successful? A couple different things. Uh, we'll know we're successful if we see an increase in online permit submissions, a reduction in turn, turnaround time for the permit issuance. Um, we'll be taking a look at the reduction in the vehicle operating costs it's tied to those electric, that fleet. Um, and as I noted, uh, we believe it's a success when we still can maintain our fees for about 15, 16 years. But again, we will be doing a review working with uh, finance this year. Moving on to city utilities. A um, couple of the key projects. Uh, leak detection system. Right now, we've got uh, about 200 acres of uh, our system covered, which is about a little over one, one and a half percent of our uh, of the area of the city, but these are mobile units, so we will move them around strategically. Um, 
We've got the valve repair and nut replacement program. It sounds very uh, interesting. It's very important though. Um, currently we've got about 76 manholes and Roy was telling me today, could be 100, I think, where there's significant groundwater infiltration. And with the 76, we're estimating that's costing our utility users about $200,000 a year extra because we are sending that to the treatment facility and paying to have that water treated when it's already clean. How are we going to measure our success um, and know that we're successful? Well, one, the lead sampling and chlorine sampling. One, we'll know if we're successful if we still reach our targets, maintain the targets as required by regulation. Um, we do inspection of black backflow devices. So we'll know that's a relatively new program, probably, when I say relatively new compared to water, uh, eight, 10 years, um, where we've got backflow prevention devices in industry and in uh, restaurants to ensure that water pressure, if it's inside the structure, isn't higher than our own uh, water pressure. If it is, then it could have contamination. So those devices are installed. And so we'll see how that's going on over the last, it's occurred over the last eight years and how that annual maintenance and how it's uh, keeping things in check. Um, manhole infiltration repairs, which I mentioned, we'll be able to see how quickly we can deal with that. And we'll actually see the results perhaps in lower bills from the region of Waterloo. And as I know, the leak detection system, we'll see if that's working. In is it predicting or is it, well, not predicting, but is it letting us know where there's water main leaks prior to us getting calls from residents or where you see the water starting to per percolate up? Brings me to engineering services. A few of the key projects there, uh, of course, the rehabilitation of Silver, Leak, Silver Lake, sorry, Laurel Creek and Waterloo Park. Uh, we've talked, we had a presentation a couple of weeks ago on the reconstruction of Larch Street and of course our long-awaited Platinum Drive extension on the west side to open up our employment lands and also to provide a relief to some of the traffic out on the west side, giving people an alternative. Things that we measure within the engineering area, uh, we've talked even on the tour this morning about the pavement quality index and how we went down one street that it was in the 20s, our targets around the 60, per, 60 target. Um, we'll be working with procurement on the performance management system for our suppliers to see if they're performing after they've received the contract, are they performing to our expectations and what do we do in a go forward position as far as allowing them to uh, uh, apply again or put in a tender. Um, data collection, right now we've been involved probably for about a decade on the National Water and Wastewater Benchmarking Initiative where it's municipalized across Canada that we're reporting on um, various measures. Um, we all use the same measurement tools and compare best management practices across the country. We don't have consultants coming in to present things to us. It's really municipalities sharing experiences and learning from each other and helping each other. It's uh, very important. And we hope, as you'll note uh, down the, the very final point, we would like to get involved in the transportation benchmarking initiative. It's not, it's not cheap, but we think for the first couple of years we'll be able to finance it within our department. And then ultimately, if we find it as worthwhile as the National Water and Wastewater Benchmarking Initiative, then we would put forward uh, uh, permanent funding through a budget process. But first, we want to test it out. Within the planning realm, key projects, we want to work on the Urban Design Manual update. It is long outstanding. Um, We'd like to uh, do more of our site plan process through electronic review and approval instead of plans coming in and circling through the office, hard copies. Um, we'd like to change that. Um, and of course, working with uh, finance on the community benefit charge strategy and bylaw, that will be a big picture item for us. Once we understand what it really does and the impact, we're still waiting for those details. Things that we measure and how we'll measure our success. Um, we'll see a, a quicker turnaround times perhaps with our site plan review. Um, 
We should, with an updated urban design manual, we should start seeing applications come in that need less change because they'll be able to understand the community's expectations. When I say they, the developers, the architects, they'll be able to understand our expectations as a community. So drawing should come in in a better state. Um, and we hope to uh, make sure we combine the site plan, the approved site plan with the building permit through this digital application process. Historically, we've had some issues where what site plan and planning has been looking at isn't necessarily what shows up in the field. There's some changes. Um, I'd like to think they were honorable changes to deal with certain situations, but we have seen where we had asked for brick and sidings going up, things like that. So we're hoping those things can be avoided because uh, it's rather uh, conflictive. Um, when we get into those situations. So that's something we hope will be improved. That brings me to transportation services. Of course, council's aware they've had some updates on the transportation man up plan. Um, they've actually had a session that fed into it not that long ago. Uh, we hope to have that done in the end of the first quarter. Um, of course, we're going to have ongoing traffic calming initiatives that come from the community and our ongoing maintenance of the roads and uh, sidewalks, although that does cover Mr. Dykstra's area. But what part we do in IPPW is actually the panel replacement, things like that, the trips and slips, the falls, that type of thing, and grinding them down or replacing the panels. And how do we measure our success? Well, we do our active Waterloo report, which talks about the numbers of people utilizing our trail system, whether it's through uh, the park um, uptown, Waterloo Park, how's that? Forgot the name. Um, number of different spots where we're reading that. So that will give us an indication of, are we going in the right direction, getting more users out of the cars and onto uh, bikes or walking? And of course, meeting our minimum maintenance standards, maintenance standards as applied by the province of Ontario, whether it's our snow removal, pothole replacement. We are going through a process right now um, where we can accurately um, keep track of, in a better way, exactly where we're fixing potholes, instead of just saying between this block and that block on a road. This is helping us with liability claims as well, or will in the future for uh, for pothole claims, as well as slips and trips and falls. So we'll monitor the results of that as well. So that brings me to conclusion. Um, again, I have all the experts, or many of the experts, there's probably about 200 of them, um, more knowledgeable than I, that uh, can answer any of the questions that you might have. That concludes it, thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Rapp. Are there questions for Commissioner Rapp? Uh, Councillor Freeman. Uh, through you, Chair Hanmer. Um, so, Mr. Rapp, some of my questions uh, relate to a couple of the different departments, primarily engineering and transportation, um, I guess, and planning. And they're, they're related to the fact that around the strategic plan, there was a, a lot of conversation in the council chambers around multimodal shift and making sure that we're investing in active transportation and that we're on track for uh, applying for bike friendly goal, or platinum designation. And um, so I, I spoke with you earlier today in terms of sitting down with staff and looking at kind of the map to platinum, the things that Share the Road told us we needed to do and, and whether and how those are funded in the budget. But the the other um, piece was just kind of more broadly around the, the business plans. I didn't really see a lot of conversation in the business plan of, around modal shift. Like it's, it's, it's kind of listed a couple of times, but I guess given the emphasis that we have around the council chamber around equity and diversity and making transportation more available to people, multimodal shift, bike friendly, platinum, energy reduction and efficiency. Um, I just, I guess I was hoping to see a bit more of that in the business plan. I think of the way of word the question because it is trans, like across divisions, then I'm allowed to answer. <laughs> so, uh, 
really, if, if you go back, I think a couple of months ago, there was a presentation that was made in the chambers where it showed, I think it was the reporting of the committees of council, that's right, where it showed the network of uh, multimodal transportation and trails that had, was in existence a decade ago. And then there was a slide that was put up that showed a myriad of how it had changed and the choices. And I can't even think of how many times folds over of, uh, of linear trails and bike paths and all that that we've grown by. But most of that occurs through the capital program or it did occur through the capital program. And that's through a lot through the work of engineering in the design, so roads are now being designed or rebuilt uh, with the bike paths, with multimodal trails, or we're adding a sidewalk. Um, so that is, you won't see that really highlighted, but that's where probably most of our money is going towards actually increasing the, act, the active transportation modes is in that, those reconstruction projects. And then you've got the active transportation uh, autonomous and active transportation group itself working on specific projects and that's probably where most people would focus and think they would see the money but most of the money is being spent in the actual reconstruction of existing roads or the creation of new roads and that's where we're seeing the massive spreading out if that answers your question for um thank you i do agree with you i know that we are making investment i'm just saying i think we should I think we should acknowledge that in the words that we use within our business plan to acknowledge how much we are committed to that more broadly. Um, the, you know, with regard to traffic calming, and this is more of a question for budget day, it's whether or not there's enough money there. And I'm just being honest, and in the time that I've been on council, which is starting to add up, um, uh, I will say that, that, that traffic speeds and traffic calming are probably one of the singular largest issues that comes through my inbox. And, and I, th I think we need to recognize that and, and ask ourselves the question, have we appropriately funded that? You don't have to answer that today, but I think it's something that I'd like you to take away, your team to take away. Um, and another thing that came to my mind's eye was... Um, and again, this is for budget day, but I'd like you to maybe, if you could think about it, is item 722, which relates to Caroline Street decorative lighting. And, and you know, I, I, I feel that I, I just would like us to look at that and say, is now the time to spend the decorative lighting in the uptown, or should we be using that to say light, um, you know, think of pedestrian scale lighting on some of our really, really busy active transportation corridors. Um, and, and, you know, whether the timing of that decorative lighting has to be now, for example, or, or, and so, and I want, and I guess I want to encourage your team to think about things like that and whether or not that's going to help us get to platinum, for example, or is that going to better help us, um, uh, increase a mode shift and thereby, you know, decrease some of the added vehicles on our roads. Um, the, and then um, I had a question, uh, a budget question later, and I can ask that of staff with regard to item 662, but it's, it's not important for today. But, and then I guess the only other question I had is with regard to the TMP recommendations. In the short-term capital budget, I didn't see a lot of resources allocated towards potential implementation of the TMP within 2020 to 2022. And so I, I just want to make sure that, that you feel as a team that you have adequate money within that budget line to achieve outcomes in that TMP within this budget <laughs> cycle. Through you, Chair Hemner, to Councillor Freeman, we feel that the funding that we have in the first for first three years of the capital budget or the three years of this budget period is is sufficient to look after what we have or we hope to have come out of the uh, transportation master plan. We feel that the funding um, we've put some funding in later years in order to uh, help 
with the transportation master plan, but the funding that we have in the first three years should be sufficient based on staff resources. And any further questions, Councilor Freeman? Any other? Offline? Okay. Other questions? Councilor uh, Henry, Councilor Vasek. I just want to pick up on, on that last thread and, and question, and I know Mr. Rapp, that uh, Chris and I had exchanged some emails on on a more detailed version of of that. I know when we look at the business plan, the you know TMP implementation um, singles out two capital reference sheets, um, and when you read the projects in there, it's not entirely clear um, you know about the the scope of that. Um, but I'm I'm wondering if Chris, you could walk us through because uh, it's more than just those two sheets that, that we'd expect to be able to be using over uh, uh, over the next few years to implement the TMP, including a lot of new ones. I was wondering if you could highlight some of those for Council. Through you, Chair Hamner, to Councillor Henry. Um, I'll do it by listing the number of the project sheet. So um, project number 712, which is pedestrian crossings, that is new funding for Low, for pedestrian level two PXOs is what we're calling them. So for example, the, the region installed one on Caroline Street near Alexandra. We know of some locations that are likely warranted. The uh, transportation master plan will provide us um, with some other locations, but we're gonna have to come up with criteria to, pri to prioritize those locations because obviously we don't have enough funds to do them all at once. This is also um, part of the vision zero um, practice. So that's 712 for pedestrian crossings. Um, 720, which is trail lighting. The transportation master plan will provide criteria as to which trails should be lit. Um, and those project sheets will have maintenance dollars for us to be able to continue to for the energy costs and any repairs. Um, 703, the crossing of Highway 85. The transportation master plan um, is looking at potential locations and will set a uh, framework for future Class EA for that project. Um, 726 is the transportation master plan. Um, this links to Vision Zero as well. This was part of, it will be an outcome of the transportation master plan, so we're being proactive with that budget sheet. Um, 719. Those are the implementation funds for the transportation master plan. And 725 is the money for an update to the transportation master plan that for 2025. Yes, yeah, so I know that was sort of helpful to expand you know, that, uh, uh, that view. And, and as I, I went through the, uh, the sheets, there's certainly a number of various initiatives that support you know, those that aren't necessarily new lines. You know. I, I'm seeing uh, seeing a bump up in in you know, sidewalk reconstruction funds. I'm seeing you know, bump ups in a number of uh, small lines, including traffic calming initiatives. That project sheet uh, highlighted an increase uh, where we decreased it. Uh, uh, I think a little while ago due to capacity issues. So uh, I know that was you know, one of my you know, focus criteria. Is do you have enough enough capacity, enough resources built into there? And it sounds like we've we've got something to sink our, our teeth into, which is which is I think really helpful. Um, and that's all missing the station area planning implementation, which is all around high traffic areas in terms of people people moving through. Uh, if I can uh, swing up to other divisions and just Chris, if that's okay. Go ahead. Um, and I can just go through the, the, the list that I, uh, uh, that I had. Um, I was wondering if... Uh, uh, you know, Ron, Adam, if you could if you could speak uh, a little bit to um, to the challenges that you anticipated and plans that you had to address the new secondary dwelling units that that you saw in homes. I saw that flagged in the business plan as there's going to be some challenges with that, and I'm, I'm curious if you can walk us through what those are and and, ha and how you're addressing that. And I'm keen on, on this. This is one of the one of the zoning implementation pieces from the new comprehensive zoning bylaw that enables everybody to add some more affordable housing uh, in their houses across the city, both for them and for anybody living living with them. Through your chair, to um, Councilor Henry, um, some of the emerging 
issues would be um, the the general knowledge of the public and uh, the building code knowledge, as well as the material difficulties on site, typically in the basements, uh, to create those units. Um, apart apart from that, from from the planning perspective, I'll I'll let uh, uh, Joel answer um, that part. Um, the uh, informing the public. Uh, and through our sessions uh, in the spring, uh, hopefully that provides uh, that needed knowledge pass through. Um, except for that, um, I can't think of anything else. Uh. No, I, I appreciate that. And I, I think that's one of the things we noticed from years of conversions to rental housing uh, legally uh, somewhat across the city and uh, to serve student demand is you certainly had a lot of issues and we wouldn't want that repeated as people, you know, roll out the secondary suites piece. If Mr. Cotter wanted to sort of pick up on, on the rest of that, I'll also add a question for him and then that'll be, that'll be it for my planned list, um, which is uh, asking about uh, uh, the status of, of the inclusionary zoning uh, initiative. I mean, I know it was in last year's business plan. It's a, it's, a, it's one that's a multi-year sort of piece, but I didn't see it in this year's business plan, so I wanted to, to make sure that we had that uh, highlighted into the chambers as part of the business plan discussion. Through you, Chair Hamner, to Councillor Hem Henry. Um, with respect to the secondary units, you're correct in that the new comprehensive zoning bylaw did establish fairly broad community-wide permissions for secondary units. Um, permissions for coach houses were also added, but much more in a limited way. Um, with respect to uh, primarily uh, restrictions around certain types of lanes within the city. The purpose, again, of the secondary units is, is one, to use our land more efficiently, but two, to create some affordable housing opportunities within the community. And it's led by provincial legislation through the Planning Act amendments. And there's continues to be ongoing amendments. So we've been working on, again, updating the bylaw to reflect the current legislation that's out there, but also working with our partners in building standards to provide that educational material. Um, there's certain handouts that are becoming available, but also talking through some of the logistics of the designs. For example, in the new zoning bylaw, in working with building standards, we allowed 100% of a basement to be converted to a second dwelling unit to avoid size area restrictions around certain types of spaces. And again, those were experiences that other municipalities had had challenges on, and we tried to avoid those through the development of our new zoning regulations. Um, so hopefully that answers your questions. With respect to inclusionary zoning, it's a project that the city uh, staff have initiated jointly with the cities of Kitchener and Cambridge. We are actively working through um, a financial uh, uh, impact assessment, which is a requirement of the legislation. There's two kind of core pieces of review that need to be undertaken. One is that financial review. The second is an assessment of the impacts of inclusionary zoning on the community, and it requires a significant amount of statistics to be gathered. So we are working uh, through that through our growth management division uh, being the lead. Um, the one challenge that Waterloo does face with inclusionary zoning is that under the Planning Act, inclusionary zoning is limited to major transit station areas, which are ion stations and the majority of our stations right now are within employment areas where we are waiting for the Regional Municipal Comprehensive Review to allow for mixed uses to, to, to happen. So we need to get through the regional work in terms of allowing some mixed use and adding residential into our Phillips Street areas up into the, the Northfield Parkside areas to allow those conversions and good things to happen. But concurrent with that, we're working on our inclusionary zoning assessment report and we're hoping to have, subject to no major hiccups, that work completed in Q2 of 2020. That ends your planned questions. Thank you, Councillor Henry. Uh, Councillor Vasig. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, Councillor Henry. Um, so one for Joel and one for Christine. Yes. Okay, so just related to lighting on pathways. Um, I know that the specific projects aren't identified yet or confirmed yet is my understanding. Um, from what you said here, and that there are criteria for different um, path, like to determine whether or not how bright the lights are, where they'll go. Um, but I just wanted to flag at this point that there's high community interest in lighting along Moses Springer um, pathway, specifically in, right in front of the um, Q 
community center and where the playground went. Everyone's really, really happy with the playground and they want the playground to feel safe all the time. So just a flag. And this next one is also, unless you wanted to say something about that. Okay. Um, and then the other one is related for Joel 626. Um, so my understanding, because I've done a few offline questions uh, about the corporate climate adaptation plan implementation, is that all of the implementation isn't happening, happening through centralized location or centralized in planning, that the idea is that every department implements things that have been identified in the corporate climate adapta adaptation plan. I was originally thinking, oh my gosh, it's 528,000 enough to implement the corporate climate adaptation plan, but that's not, from my understanding, what it's meant for. It's meant to facilitate an understanding of how and support other departments to um, implement uh, things and ensure that all the other divisions are, um, are, are doing that work and taking ownership of that work. Um, so I guess my hope is that um, in future budgets or uh, as we move along in the next few years that we um, put into plans and make it really clear how all the different divisions are um, implementing items from the corporate cl climate adaptation plan so that we know where there might be gaps and how we might best support all the divisions to be working through that sustainability lens. Uh, through you, Chair Hamner, to Councillor Vasek. Uh, it's a great um, recommendation. Ultimately, one of the things we do, we do work very collaboratively, and this is one of those projects that touches many divisions across the city. Um, and we're working with all of those divisions, one, to create the plan, um, but also to implement the plan. What we often don't do is spend enough time kind of gathering that information and communicating the successes that we've undertaken. You're correct in that 626, that is really um, money that's intended to support um, some of the other divisions as well as deal with some of the projects that may not be specific to one area um, but there's lots of initiatives that are going on corporate wide so we can work certainly on kind of gathering that information and maybe reporting back to council from time to time on the status of where we're at with the climate adaptation or the corporate climate adaptation plan and uh, some of the successes and metrics that we've had that's right thank you that would be very exciting No further questions, Councillor Fessig? Okay. Councillor Vonagar. <laughs> uh, thank you, through you, Chair uh, Hanma. So my fellow councillors have asked a number of things that I was already looking at, as well, I was also looking at, but I just wanted to clarify a few points from the proposed budget. One is there's a line item for road widenings and intersection widenings. Um, and, you know, and if we, we've discussed here, if we want to push for transportation mode change, you know, congestion can no longer be considered an enemy. So I just want to clarify for all the people who are reading the budget for themselves at home, um, just want to clarify that this isn't a blanket funding for automatic road widenings, correct? It's just to make sure that development charges cover part of the cost should they be deemed required. Sir Councillor Hammer, I'll just answer that and say, Christine, getting up. That is correct. It's to deal with growth related, where a traffic study typically associated with a development is requiring something off or outside of their site. And so we have to pick that up. And it's actually the development industry that's paying through for that through development charges. Uh, and, and to pick up on a topic that's already been discussed a bit. So when we, you know, there are strong calls for traffic calming studies and implementation, pedestrian crossings and more. Uh, if we were to allocate more funding to such projects, do we have staff capacity to follow through and do more things? Or are you kind of requesting funding at the level that can be achieved? <laughs> Through you, Chair Hamner, to Councillor Bonagor. At this point, I would say if additional funds are placed within a traffic calming budget, we would not have the existing staff resources to um, fulfill those needs. If funding was provided, I would suspect we could hire consultants to, to do that. But within our current staffing resources, extra traffic calming studies would be a, a challenge. Thank you. Um, 
while we're clarifying things, there is a line item which is looking at the, replace, uh, the replacement of retaining walls. I know that sometimes across the city, the, these retaining walls are in states of disrepair and need to be removed. So will this line item also cover removal of retaining walls where warranted? Uh, yes, it will uh, do retaining walls that are not required any further, but generally, the budget is so small, we have to combine several years together to do certain retaining walls because we do have some retaining walls that are existing on city property right now that are very large and will require a substantial amount of work to replace them. And, and my final question is probably a big gnarly one for the commissioner. Um, when we're looking at budgets and people are looking at potential rate increases and potential infrastructure levies, one of the first things people will turn around and say is, well, why don't you cut spending on roads? That we all be able to cover a lot of money if we cut spending on roads. So I'm just going to, let me ask it here. Um, if council was seeking ways to avoid an infrastructure levy or, or do something like that. Um, is it even possible or feasible to cut the budget of roads and what kind of impact would that have? Through Councillor Hanmer to Councillor Ponagor, yes. However, uh, it's community expectation. Roads is one of the few pieces of linear infrastructure that council can really choose the level of service. Council could, if they wish, allow our streets to be gravel, literally. There's nothing that says, and that's why there are gravel roads throughout the province, that you can have gravel roads. Um, but then based on vehicular, like the average annual daily traffic and community expectations, that's not going to work. So currently our, our target is about 60 out of 100 for our, our pavement index. And it will be up to council as we progress with each, each budget as to what level of pavement quality is council or the community through council prepared to accept. But that's the one piece of infrastructure, linear infrastructure, that we can let go. But I don't think the community would uh, accept it, to be honest. I think uh, our current target of 60 might be, uh, might not be hitting their target as it is. I, I didn't intend to make anyone think I am for or against that approach. I just wanted to air it, <laughs> given how many times I hear it. Thank yep. you. So noted. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just before I go back to you, Councillor Freeman, I'll ask for those who haven't asked any questions, any further questions? Councillor Bodily and then Councillor Freeman. Uh, thank you through you, uh, Councillor Henry or Councillor Hammer, excuse me. Um, just on the on this commentary around uh, around the amount of money that we allocate towards roads, um, w w when we look at some of the the sort of big picture pie charts that show that we're spending X percentage on roads, is it fair to say that instead of it being allocated towards roads, it's really being ad allocated towards transportation infrastructure. It includes things like sidewalks and bike lanes and trails and lighting and trails, et cetera. Through you, Chair Hamner, to Councillor Bodily. Yes, all of the um, pieces of the road also include the sidewalks, the curb, um, any bike lanes, whether it be separated or non-separated. So it is a transportation, you're right, it is transportation, not necessarily a road. And I only say that because I I, I really think that, that words matter. And when people look at the, the budget from a, from a big picture, 20,000 feet sort of perspective, they look at that and they say roads and they think cars, and that's that's not necessarily true. And so I would, I would give some thought or pause to future uh, discussions about how we 
put this out to the public um, and and the potential for us to use things like transportation infrastructure as opposed to roads. But um, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Um, a question uh, perhaps for Joel, and this is really around um, the uh, uh, climate emergency declaration that we've put forward and planning's role in uh, um, encouraging uh, green building outside of the buildings that we own. And uh, I'm curious, um, I'm curious whether or not any thought within uh, the planning department from a business planning perspective has been put forward towards uh, whether we need budget money to encourage the private sector to do more things um, in order for us to achieve our uh, community climate targets, I guess. Through you, Councillor Hamner to Councillor Bodley. Um, it's a good question. There's some ongoing conversations with respect to green building initiatives. One of my development planners sits on a kind of intermunicipal working group to, to discuss uh, the concept. Um, the challenge ultimately is, is that planning really can't influence the way buildings are constructed. The building code is responsible for that type of uh, legislative requirement. So it's difficult for um, the, the planning department to influence green building construction. But what we can do is, is there's provisions under Section 41 of the Planning Act, which is site plan control, that allows for sustainable um, considerations around the exteriors of buildings. So again, as we update our urban design manual. Again, those are the issues that we can work towards uh, enhancing through our standards. Um, but also the manual does guide and encourage practices to happen. So again, as a municipality to try and lead those objectives, while we can't necessarily mandate certain things, we can certainly encourage certain things to be underdone, un undertaken. And then further, uh, we do have some money in outer years around community improvement plans. And again, those types of mechanisms um, are, are opportunities for council to consider enhancements to heritage infrastructure, green building infrastructure, affordable housing, all of those community interest pieces that creates the platform through which council can <laughs> consider um, some of those endeavors. So we've tried to work within the budget and, and allocate accordingly um, in the years that we can. Uh, to bring some of those initiatives forward. But yes, it is on our mind. We just don't have a, a lot of legislative authority around such matters. Understood. Thank you. Uh, and then my last question is probably for Joel as well, too. And I guess this is a bit of the a bit of the catch twenty two. And I, I'm just looking maybe for some comments from you in this regard. When we when we do go through the urban design manual, one of the things that we we hear from uh, developers is that our urban design guidelines are uh, what's causing what's um, contributing to the affordability issue that we're dealing with in the city of Waterloo? We're very. Um, Picky, I guess, for lack of a better word, in terms of what we what we uh, want our developers to be doing with their buildings, and I wonder if there's anything within the uh, urban design update that will look at how it impacts the affordability of of buildings going forward. Uh, through you, Chair, to Councillor Bodily, um, it's a good question. We haven't really had a discussion around the impacts of the design elements specifically regarding affordability. Um, but it is an, an element um, in terms of the design conversation when we bring these out for community engagements. The urban design component is one of those pieces where the community does want good public realm. They do want quality architecture. And we strive to the extent that we can in the planning division to balance those objectives against um, other community objectives such as affordable housing. So we do that in our day-to-day -day activity. I don't know if it's specifically raised in our urban design uh, manual that's currently in, in force. As Mr. Rapp indicated, it was done in 2009. It's time for an update to that manual to bring in issues around visitable housing, affordable housing, some of those more contemporary uh, urban planning conversations that are going on, weaving those in a more um, explicit way into the urban design manual. So certainly it's something we'll have a look at um, as part of some of those other elements like the green building design requirements. Nothing further? Councillor Freeman. Thank you. I, uh, I just didn't want to leave Francis and Roy out of the conversation. <laughs> um, so, you know, a couple of things that stand out to me on the worksheets that I think are worthwhile noting. Um, there are some places where we're allocating capital resources towards um, replacement of a pedestrian trail, for example. Um, 
um, under our um, item 544. And it would be good to tag those things and make sure we include them as being part of the safe transportation um, investment as well, because that's helping to move people through our trails and park system as opposed to just through our transportation corridors. Um, Roy, can you speak to the INI issue and you know how how within this budget we're starting to address that? Because as as we're seeing our water rates increase dramatically, we know a lot of that is from infiltration into the sanitary system that doesn't necessarily need to be there. So, how are we attacking that? So, it's a twofold question: are we are we are we considering putting in a metering device when we put in new sewers, for example, so that we have ways to actually monitor? Um, I and I issues even within new infrastructure, and then how are we attacking the old infrastructure on that piece? Through you, uh, Chair uh, Hamner, to Councillor uh, Freeman, we don't have any flow monitors for the I and I, <clears throat> um, but it's probably a really good idea, especially after last weekend. Um, <laughs> We are attacking the INI that we uncover through manhole inspections by our staff actually doing um, a repair that, that's done by an injection method. Um, some of the larger ones where you're getting infiltration rates of like 10 liters a second, we are incapable of doing those. We contract those out, but uh, the smaller ones, say uh, four liters per minute, something like that, we're very capable of doing those through the uh, uh, seal guard method. And we've had some really good results. I guess just fundamentally, it, at some point in time, I think that we need to sit down and start correlating the increase in water rates and our our infiltration of clean water into our sanitary system. I think at some point we, we just, we have to do that heavy lifting. I don't know what it looks like, but um, you know, it, it, it it's just, I, I, I think it's a combined effort most notably with the region, to be honest with you, because it obviously affects their their yeah. treatment rates and, and their investment in, in wastewater treatment. But I, I think it's, I think it's a, a huge concern and I even worry about what the I and I looks like on new pipes like we know they leak too so how do we how do we actually start making a change on this do you need more inspection for example on on new construction do you, do you need more flow, flow meters I don't know what it looks like but but I, I worry about that and um, and how we how we actually start you know, eating the elephant one bite at a time. Well, I'll give an example from the weekend. One of our smaller systems um, was overwhelmed by clean water. So I will be doing some background investigation into what caused that because really it shouldn't have happened. So it's maybe not a total um, pipe issue. It could be also on the private side that's introducing the clean water. Commissioner Rapp had some information to add. Certainly, I would actually look to Mr. Ormson just on some of the history that he's aware of for the new infrastructure and the new subdivisions. Thanks, Cam. Um, through you, Chair Hamner, to uh, answer Councillor Freeman's question. Um, for new development, we really um, we do fight locations where there's naturally high groundwater elevations, and um, you know that's always a challenge, even with brand new infrastructure. But we do conduct um, CCTV inspections very thoroughly, uh, a minimum of twice before we assume any of the infrastructure from the private sector. And they are required to repair pipe defects. Um, but we do have this circumstance in Waterloo, and it, it, it is based on our hydrogeology in the city where we have a lot of pipes that are underwater. And just that's just a, a consequence of, of where we sit geographically. Um, but through work that actually Dan and Francis' teams have done over the years, we have done individual studies. We looked at individual sewer sheds to see what can be done because you're right, it's very costly to treat clean water. Uh, we have also had opinions that actually say it's cheaper to, to treat clean water 
than it is to try and um, do anything, any mitigation work, which doesn't sit well with staff. It wasn't advice we, we really like to hear, but um, there are some economic realities to the cost of going in and rebuilding sewer sheds that are, uh, again, under that natural high groundwater condition. Anything further, Councillor Freeman? Um, I think that that was, I think those were my primary comments. Thank you. Pardon? Through you. Oh, uh, Francis, go ahead. Yep, sorry. Um, through you, uh, Councillor Hanwerk, to uh, Councillor Freeman, just to add to what Mr. Uh, Ron Armson uh, mentioned, uh, there's also protocols in terms of uh, when completing uh, design submissions uh, for technical submissions from consultants. We make sure that uh, you know, the services are above the uh, high water table. If there's any mounding impacts on uh, infrastructure, uh, we try to be above that as well too. Uh, if for whatever reason we can't uh, achieve those uh, desired uh, targets, there are things like cutoff collars and things like that that you can kind of incorporate into design and installation just to prevent, uh, kind of try to reduce the I and I uh, during construction. Mayor, Councillor Veith, any questions? Mayor Jorsky. Comment. Well, just to, to thank the team for um, for what I see is a lot of progressive, efficient, and innovative business plans. On the progressive side, certainly the um, adaptation of uh, electric vehicles, all the work that we're doing in active uh, transportation and uh, the connectivity and the wayfinding signage. From an efficiency standpoint, eliminating the groundwater uh, infiltration and online building permits. And then finally, uh, innovative, the AMI, which we've talked about for, for many years, and the automated leak detection. These are just some of the things that stand out to me as uh, important to the citizens of Waterloo and things that we're able to accomplish in the next three years. So I just wanted to say thank you for the, uh, the business plans. Okay. Great. Seeing no further further questions, I'll to echo the thanks to the IPPW staff, Cam, Francis, Ron, Joel, Christine, and, and Roy for the work that you've done in putting the business plans together for us and then your openness with the questions that we've had today. So thank you very much for that. We are recessed now until 6.30. <laughs>